strange overcast today. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just about a minute. If you are just joining us, if you just come in, um, please go ahead, settle in, uh, pour yourself a cup of tea if that's your thing, um, another cup of coffee if that's your thing, and go ahead and um, in the chat if you could provide your name, um, your organization if you represent one, and your location in the Chicago Wilderness region or beyond. And we'll get started um, in just about now, why don't we why don't we go ahead? We have about 40, 41 folks in the room. Um, so hello, uh, happy autumn. Um, it definitely is beginning to feel like autumn out there today. And my name is Brandon Hayes and I am the founder and principal of Bold Bison Communications and Consulting. Um, and one of the things that Bold Bison does is to facilitate the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan um, working group um, that is that it, that grew out of a collaborative project of the Chicago Wilderness Alliance and the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. We'll talk a little bit more about the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan in a moment, but um, today, welcome to this cafe. Um, one of a series of cafes provided by the Chicago Wilderness Alliance. If you are having any technical difficulties today in today's cafe, you will see um, here in the room Maria Sadowski from the Chicago Wilderness Alliance, um, who will be able to help with any technical difficulties. Speaking of technical difficulties, um, our usual host, Laura Riley, um, is having some of her own today. She will hopefully be back on shortly um, and will be able to help with any other sort of technical issues or things that you might have. So how we're going to do today's cafe is I'm going to provide an overview of oaks in the region and sort of the threats that they're under and a little bit of a background on the oak ecosystem recovery plan. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to introduce their work. And then we're going to move into a panel conversation. Throughout the panel conversation, we would love to have your questions um, and however you feel free to, to ask them. So whether you want to use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand so that you can be called on, turn on your mic and ask your question that way, or whether you prefer to ask your question in the chat. Um, whichever you are more comfortable with is just fine. Until it's time for you to turn your mic on after raising your hand, we do ask that everyone um, might mute your microphones so that we don't have any distractions today as we go through the material. Um, today, I am joined by a wonderful panel and I am pulling up everyone's names now. Um, a wonderful panel of folks. Um, so we have Kurt Dreiselker um, from the Morton Arboretum, Casey Sullivan from Argonne National Laboratory, Bob Fisher from Bird Conservation Network, and Sarah Soros from Open Lands. And all four of those folks are involved in some way in the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Working Group um, and on the plan and the project and connected to Oaks to, to um, if I could ask folks who are not muted, if you could go ahead and mute. Um, and sort of the urban forest and ecological restoration and sort of the health of our region sort of across the Chicago wilderness region in addition to be involved in the Chicago Wilderness Alliance too. So we'll hear a lot more from our four great panelists um, in just a few minutes. But before I turn it over to them and begin our conversation, I do want to just sort of set the stage and give us all a little bit of background in terms of, of oaks in the Chicago region. And this map focuses on Illinois, but it's sort of representative of the, the larger Chicago wilderness region. These maps are from the 1830s. And what they show that you see there on the left um, is the oaks versus the non-oaks on the right. And so you can see how dense the distribution of oaks was um, pre-settlement, pre pre sort of white settlers coming into the region. Um, and you can see just how important oaks were and how and how they did spread throughout Illinois. And obviously you can see those borders up into Wisconsin and going over into Indiana and the other parts of the Chicago wilderness region. Oaks are definitely part of our natural history here in the Prairie State. Um, the oldest oak trees um, from those maps are reaching the end of their lives. 
Um, and so we have very few younger trees replacing them in those groves because of the lack of you know, regeneration, because of the change in forest composition, because of fragmentation of regional ecosystems, because of the, of the introduction of invasive species and pests, um, expanded populations of herbivores, a uh, pollution and change climate change are all sort of things that are a big picture affecting our oak ecosystems here in the Chicago wilderness region. We'll hear a lot more about that in a moment. And one of the things here that you can see right there is this fragmentation. So you see sort of you, what you can see in this image is you see some, some remnant woodlands, you see a lot of suburban development, you see those development pressures, you see some open spaces, but you see essentially that highly fragmented landscape that is indicative of a lot of the Chicago wilderness region that we are facing. And you can see how, you know, some of those pieces and parcels and that subdivision of the foreground are sort of carved out of what was likely oak woodland or other woodlands before development. Um, another thing to keep in mind, and we'll hear more about this as we go through, is how important fire is for oaks, that they grew up, as you can see, with fire. Um, and that was very intentional. Native Americans who lived in this region um, did do burning as part of their way of maintaining oaks and oak ecosystems and woodlands and preventing and preventing other species from coming in because of the importance of oaks as food and habitat um, within within in ceremony within culture before settlement. So the idea of of this of our landscapes, of our natural landscapes before 1830 were very highly, highly curated by Native Americans, and they used fire as a major way of doing that. So a lot of the sort of fire in terms of ecological uh, ecological restoration, that's part of what we're going to talk about a bit today, um, harkens back to, to that tradition from how these woodlands were managed pre-settlement. To sort of show a bit about, you know, invasive species, um, you see here some of the most, most, two of the most abundant and destructive invasive species in the Chicago region, European buckthorn and garlic mustard. Um, Non-native plant species lead to reduction in biological diversity. Biological diversity is key to, to a healthy ecosystem. Non-native invasive plant species can outcompete our native plants quickly by replacing them, altering soil chemistry, or shading them out. And here's some of the sort of list of some of the worst offenders in terms of invasive plants. So we're going to hear more about those as we continue the conversation today. And one of the things that happens, as you can see here, is canopy closure. So when you have something like European buckthorn coming into a woodland, um, what happens is not only does it change the soil chemistry, but it also blocks out, it shades out oak seedlings and younger plants in sort of that nice, more open understory and doesn't allow light to get down there so that oaks can, can thrive and grow. And that's why we end up with, with forest composition that is largely older trees. Diseases and pests are coming in. Um, including including you know, Baroque blight and, and lots of other things, which we'll hear about in, when we get to our panelists. And also, okay, all right. So we went through the, the list of, of the sort of what's affecting oaks. So now what can we do about it? And we're we'll talk a lot about what you as an individual can do about it as we go through today. But, but the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan um, pulled on all of this data and looked at a lot of this historical data and identified our remnant oak ecosystems. And some of those were in forest preserve properties, so they were already in protected lands. Some of them sort of blend out of forest preserve properties through neighborhoods, and we'll hear about that later on too in Lake County, um, through sort of developments and homeowners association areas and things like that, or maybe or maybe the properties of businesses um, that have sort of those extensions of our remnant oak ecosystems. And sort of thinking about how do we keep healthy those oak ecosystems that survived, and how do we collaboratively work 
toward this goal. And so what happened after the Chicago Wilderness Alliance, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, Morton Arboretum put resources in developing this recovery plan um, was this idea of everyone working together toward a shared goal. And the way that it works on the ground is that this idea of, of making sure that those core remnant ecosystems are as healthy as possible, that invasives are removed, that, that those very core, most important parcels have the opportunity to thrive and to grow, to make sure that there's a buffer around them that maybe isn't as, as perfect, but at least um, in terms of invasive species, in terms of, of impacts from development or other, or other or other things, pollution and other things, that it, you know, protects that core, and then making sure that there are corridors, corridors for wildlife in between, corridors for, for you know, ecosystems to move um, between those, those cores and buffers. And so within each of the counties that are part of the greater Chicago land area, um, have representatives that are part of the Oak Ecosystem Working Group. And they are both land trusts, they are forest preserves or other public agencies. Um, they are organizations that are doing conservation work or stewardship work. And they have come together to identify what are some of those key core areas, those key most important remnant woodlands in each of the counties and going up to, with our partners in Wisconsin and in Indiana to really focus on, like, where do we really want to get the most bang for our buck? And then we look in terms of sharing resources and sharing opportunities, whether those are funding resources, whether they're knowledge, whether it's tours of what folks are doing in other parts of the region. These are all ways that we are helping to sort of move and implement the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan. So if you are interested in being part of the working group being or hearing more about what's going on. Um, we do have public events and workshops often hosted at the Morton Arboretum or online. We have, you know, private working group only tours and sort of a mixture of the both and of both. And so, for instance, earlier this year, we saw some great work on the ground in Lake County. Um, a lot of invasive species removal being done by the Forest Preserve District of Lake County was one of our tours that we went on. And another one was in DuPage County and looking at a natural laboratory that sprang up um, when there was tornado impact of several years ago go on an oak ecosystem in DuPage County on Forest Preserve property and, able to, and it was already a site that was showing um, a research site showing sort of invasive species removal, showing, um, um, you know, impacts on herbivores in the space and the tornado kind of ripped through it and was able to make a natural laboratory to see sort of how does an oak ecosystem um, recover from a natural event, a lot of, you know, tree removal, a sort of very violent, sudden event coming through. And that was another tour we were able to do. So in addition to sharing resources and best practices, things we're hearing on the ground around pests um, and ways to, to combat them and ways to create shared resources, um, whether they're brochures or best practices. These are all ways that across the entire region, the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan Working Group is moving forward and moving things forward for Oaks. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview um, and we can talk a bit more about it in the Q&A. But now I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna turn it over to some of our experts, beginning with Kurt, um, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Brandon. I trust everybody can hear me okay. Um, welcome and uh, thank you for having me. So um, as the screen shows, my name is Kurt Dreisilker. I'm with the Morton Arboretum. I'm the head of natural resources and collections horticulture. And so I'm just gonna show a few slides here that sort of give uh, us the context of where I work, plus um, talk about some of the lessons that we've learned in very brief detail. Um, over the past few decades, really. Uh, but if you look at these two images, you can see the red outlined area kind of in the center of those uh, of the land mass. That's actually the current uh, outline of the Morton Arboretum. And you can see the two sites left and right um, back then and today, and the differences in those polygons, which are representative of the oak ecosystem in the region. So basically the point is that we have about 17% of the oak ecosystem left 
And if you squint just hard enough, you can see just the tiny, tiny little yellow polygons on the image on the right. Uh, so next slide, please. So zooming in a little bit, we have the Morton Arboretum with one of those polygons or a couple of those polygons in the image on the top. And then without the image of the um, historic timber grove in the image on the bottom. And so you can see that the Morton Arboretum uh, laid out there. And essentially what I'm trying to show is this big area on the right hand side or the Eastern edge of the Arboretum. And that's the Oak Woodland where I focus my work. And so that is what we call the East Woods. And so it's about 700 acres but you can see it's not entirely contiguous. There are little cutouts due to landscape, uh, well, historic land use in the past. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And if we think about how these oak woodlands have changed over the years, we can see another comparison of these two uh, of the Arboretum. We can see an image from 1939 on the top, a black and white image with the current outline of the Arboretum. And you can see that timber grove on the east side is more significantly cut into, but you can also study it and see lots of uh, other plantings that have been done in the earliest years of the Arboretum. But over the over time, you can transition down to the bottom image there with your eyes and you can see that the landscape has filled in. And so many of us on the, on the call today are probably aware of this concept about how these uh, oak ecosystems have changed over the time. Uh, next slide, please. And we call that process musification. This is just an on the ground, within the Morton Arboretum uh, set of images that compares uh, before, well, back then and today. So these two images are, are taken about 90 years apart from the same location within the center of the East Woods. And so just pointing out in the image on the left, you can see the open uh, woodland structure, canopy uh, gaps above, and then over time in the image on the right, you can see the trees have filled in. So that's essentially what's going on here. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, dating back to about the mid 1980s, um, some of our staff have been uh, looking into the effects of prescribed burning on our site. And so these are two images on the left burned annually and on, on the right unburned. And we can see that there are differences in the woody structure. Notice these are obviously in the winter time and the dormant season. Um, so you can see some differences in, in the structure of the woody vegetation uh, from that annual fire over the course of about 30 years, 30 plus years actually. Um, but fire alone doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, helping us to sustain the entire oak woodland. So if you can fast forward, uh, next, next slide, please. Oh yeah, so here's, here's one image of kind of what that looks like during the growing season. Uh, this is an image on, uh, from the East Woods where we've burned annually. This time it's on the right-hand side of the road. And on the left-hand side of the road, we have an unburned um, site. So these, uh, this one image is a pretty good comparison just uh, in, in a visual sense of the changes that have happened over, the for over time in the forest. You can see a lot of the diversity is responding and returning in the understory, the native uh, wildflowers, forbs, grasses, sedges. Um, in, in the image on, on the right-hand side of the road, but it's more or less blocked by the rest of the veg woody vegetation on the left. Um, next slide, please. So when we think about fire, fire alone has, has helped us to restore some of the biodiversity in our um, oak, oak woodlands, but um, we're still not seeing oak seedlings developing. And so here's uh, kind of a before and after uh, set of images taken over the course of about 15 years, um, demonstrating some of our work using silvicultural management. So this is essentially um, following prescribed thinning treatments within our woodlands um, over a set of uh, over a period of time. In this case, about 15 years. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about the significance of the 15-year period, maybe in a little bit, but. Um, we'll just uh, leave it as this for now, just indicating that fire and silvicultural management seem to be a pretty good uh, recipe for uh, sustainability of our oak, oak woodlands. Next slide, please. And then just my final slide as an introduction, uh, this is kind of a, a set of images showing 
uh, some of the results, some of the early results of more of our prescribed silvicultural treatments. Um, and I'm cautiously optimistic at the moment, uh, recognizing that we do have oak seedlings. And if you study these images uh, close enough, you can see some of these oak seedlings developing, um, but many of them are knee high at best at the moment. But you can see kind of the open structure of the, of the forest, especially in the image on the right. So that's kind of a brief whirlwind introduction to our work at Morton Arboretum and uh, some of the work and a sense of the place that, um, that I conduct my work. And so I think I'll turn it over to uh, our next uh, panelist. Thank you, Brendan. Excellent, thank you, Craig. Uh, next up, we have Casey Sullivan, who's Natural Resources Manager at Argonne National Laboratory. Casey, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I also hope that uh, people can hear me. Um, so I am the Natural Resources Manager at Argonne National Laboratory. We are 22 miles west and southwest of downtown Chicago. And if you did not know, Argonne National Laboratory is the home for much of the peaceful use of atomic energy over the last, whatever, since the onset of atomic energy <clears throat> creation. So many of your atomic reactors and uh, reactors and ships actually come from uh, technology that was developed here at Argonne National Laboratory. And if you look at this visual on the left, you can see that a large component of Argonne is still in a natural state. It had a, a number of uh, land uses in the past, but kind of in the center right, you can see a, a wooded area that has never been touched by <clears throat> logging or grazing, and it happens to be one of our most diverse sites. So over, next please. <clears throat> Since my time here at Argon, we have monitored the, monitored the success of our, our work here. And if you can imagine back in 2009, much of this with the legend on the lower right, much of this map was a um, depiction of uh, areas with a floristic quality index less than 28. And through intensive management and tracking of that over the last 15 years, we have made pretty substantial advancements where we are having what we call ecosystem management units with floristic quality indexes of 50 or more. And again, that center right parcel is, is in the 60, 65 range. But one of the things that I do, and I'm really kind of impassioned about is this, this technology that is GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And this map was created, again, with 15 years of data. We have four uh, parameters that we're tracking. We're tracking uh, floristic quality index, a mean C, the number of native species, as well as the number of invasive species. So um, I use a lot of GIS, but in recent years, I've also been working with the Chicago Wilderness uh, Green Vision and Mapping Group. Next slide, please. And with that group, um, I offer the perspective of uh, forest in general, but oak, oaks in general for the region. And so here we have um, a GIS creation from visualizations from uh, the Field Museum, Morton Arboretum in Chicago Wilderness. I see I have a question, but I'll, I'll hold off on answering that. And this is the historic range of timber. And you can see it was pretty substantial, uh, largely oak hickory after 1871. If you didn't know that uh, our, some of our Eastern counties with, the, with sand had uh, populations of um, white pine intermixed with oak hickory. And after 1871, the year of the Chicago fire, much of um, Michigan and portions of Indiana burned and oak hickory and beech maple moved into those areas. Next, please. <clears throat> and so now you have another GIS uh, overlay with um, a visualization that came from the National Land Cover Database of Tree Canopy, where I filtered out um, all uh, visualizations of 50% uh, or less canopy. 
And then it's, of course, overlaying against the uh, former timberlands. And you can see there's tremendous amount of areas that still have timber left. And a lot of that is oak hickory. Next, please. And then, of course, we have uh, another visualization. Here is the protected lands layer that, that uh, the great David Holman has created for the hub group. And what it shows here is that in addition to large forest tracts, forest tracks, we have a lot of protected areas. Uh, Chicago, Chicago region uh, and Illinois is well represented, but we also have protected lands in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Michigan. But much of what we see here in the green is not protected. It is um, in the hands of private ownership. So we still have a lot to work with to achieve some of the goals of what we, many of us in this uh, uh, cafe know of as 30 by 30, or if we were to achieve uh, E.O. Wilson's dream, 50 by 50, that means 50% 50 of the land and uh, natural state by 2050. Next, please. So here's a, an interesting visualization. This is a, a black, actually an oak forest in the dune region, or it was, and that's a pile of wood chips. That's nearly three stories high. So if I hadn't mentioned, this was about 10 acres. And um, with the story of the Sycamore Gap of a tree being cut down in Scotland, we have worldwide outrage. Well, the question is, is why, why didn't, why wasn't there outrage that 10 acres of forest was turned into a, a pile of wood chips uh, three stories high? And the answer to that comes from policy. And um, if you've been around uh, um, local government officials, they often talk about the highest and best use of land. And that's that's because uh, local governments are starved for revenue. So they have to look at um, units of land for the, 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 the largest amount of revenue. And of course, forests and natural areas do not generate a lot of revenue. So you have to see that there is a another component to uh, conservation that is a local policy. But another uh, um, thing to see here is you see the heavy equipment on the right. In addition to the, the stance of um, local governments, you have another actor in the conversion of land, and that's private finance. You can't cut down 10 acres of forest in a matter of 10 days without the banking and um, finance community uh, enabling this type of practice. And the reason I say this is because um, if we are to achieve 20 or 30 by 30 or 50 by 50, these two communities or actors in land conversion need to be brought to the table. So we need to have planners and the banking community involved in this effort to achieve 30 by 30. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bob Fisher, representing Bird Conservation Network. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brandon. Um, uh, I'm the uh, communications chair for the Bird Conservation Network, which is a coalition of about uh, 20 uh, uh, 20 gr groups, uh, mostly around Chicago, but uh, does include some uh, uh, larger uh, larger groups. The American Bird Conservancy is a member, for example. And uh, uh, one of the questions and and uh, issues that that we face is uh, how can we do more to protect our migratory birds? And uh, are there solutions? And uh, the, the answer is in fact, yes. And one of the ways to do that is by pr protecting, rebuilding, enhancing, uh, especially the oak ecosystem here in, uh, in Northeastern Illinois and up into Wisconsin and over and in, into Indiana. So we've got a, an, a, a genuine opportunity to, uh, uh, I guess I'll say, uh, make things better for the migratory birds that travel through our area twice a year. Uh, go, go to the next slide, if you would, please. 
So what is the scale of that migration? Um, it's, it's very, very large. A half a billion birds pass through, across, and alongside of Lake Michigan uh, every spring going north. Uh, some of them stay here and nest, but uh, let's say uh, essentially 90% of them keep heading north to nest in the, uh, in the boreal forest and so forth. So the, uh, the fact is that, uh, that uh, we are perhaps, uh, if not the most important migration cor corridor in North America, certainly one of the most important migration corridors. And then in the fall, because of the uh, uh, birth and successful fledging of youngsters, the numbers actually, the number of birds, number of birds that travel uh, back south uh, actually is larger than what came up north that same spring. So you've got a major uh, corridor and it's really important. Next, please. Next slide. So there's a, uh, uh, a study that was done a number of years ago, and I'll show you the slide in a second. But the, uh, the fact is that uh, the migratory birds that we're talking about, uh, the oak ecosystem is a very important food source for them, uh, especially in springtime. Uh, they, uh, uh, they feed uh, on on the uh, caterpillars, if you will, that uh, come out in, among the oaks every spring. So that food source is extremely important to give them energy and ability to keep flying. Um, so as you can see from this slide, the uh, uh, Lepidoptera, I always have trouble saying that word, Lep the uh, those larvae constitute about 95% of the uh, of the food source, the biomass available to those birds as they're traveling. Go to the next slide, please. So here's, this is a, a good illustration of the peak of the uh, availability of food and also the timing and peak of migration. Uh, and uh, if you look carefully, uh, you can see some uh, when the numbers of those larvae start to decline, the birds have largely passed through or set up shop here. So you've got a situation where uh, uh, a food source is made, made available historically and anything we can do to enhance that availability will benefit uh, uh, the migratory birds that, uh, not just the ones that stop here to breed, but those that keep going further north. So we are an extremely important area for that pr purpose. Um, and of course, uh, as, as many people have often said, birds are really a good indicator of the health of the environment. They are really are the canaries in the, in the coal mine. So next, so how do you do that? You prioritize uh, stopover sites. You uh, uh, restore and enhance uh, tree species, tree, tree species, tree composition, uh, edge habitats, dense understory. You, uh, you uh, tr very often, uh, birds travel along waterways, rivers, streams, and so forth. Uh, you just heard a little bit about, uh, about uh, the lab. Argonne, of course, it's surrounded by Waterfall Glen, and uh, there's a creek that runs through Waterfall Glen, which is very important for the birds that migrate through every year. So you have a, uh, a need which is fulfilled by providing habitat and certainly uh, one of the missions of the uh, Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan is to provide that habitat, to not just maintain it, but to build it out further. 
Uh, one more. So th these are, in essence, the issues. Uh, if we can increase migratory bird stopover habitat in, in the Chicago wilderness area, if we can uh, plant appropriate understory vegetation, I'll I'll take a shot at Asian honeysuckle, for example. That's or or uh, uh, buckthorn. Those two aliens displace a lot of native plants with the, which uh, the birds were used to feeding in for thousands of years. Uh, not only that, they provide habitat for the insects, especially Lepidoptera that. Uh, that use the, uh, uh, the those same habitats, and uh, uh, we need to develop techniques to repopulate areas that have been cleared and burned with those beneficial insects, and uh, we need to uh, continue to develop uh, methods of uh, uh, enhancing the species health and species diversity. Next, please. Or is that the last one? No, that's that was my. I, uh, I I had sent a couple more along, but I didn't realize that uh, your colleague uh, wasn't there this morning. But uh, just to sum it up, uh, there's about oh 200 species that travel through the area, uh, and there's approximately. Uh, 65 to 75 woodland species that nest in our area. And they have essentially the same needs as the migratory birds that travel through, uh, but th those needs are uh, over a longer period of time because they are, they are uh, feeding their youngsters those uh, insects, those uh, caterpillar larvae and so forth to uh, create the next generation of birds. Uh, I would add for everybody's benefit, uh, I, today was a uh, somewhat of a fallout day here in uh, Northern Illinois. The, uh, a lot of the birds that had not yet moved south uh, on migration moved overnight and as a result a lot of birders are very happy today because they were seeing a lot of things they hadn't seen much of so far this uh, this fall but the overall message that i want to convey is that number one we can do a heck of a lot to uh, uh, help both our resident breeding species of birds and the uh, migrants that pass through here to breed further north both in the spring and in the fall uh, by enhancing, uh, re rebuilding, and uh, expanding uh, oak, the oak woodland ecosystem across the region. Uh, I'm not sure we can get back to where we were in the early 1800s, but we can certainly make, uh, make some major improvements in how much habitat's available. And one of the ways of doing that, of course, is to uh, eliminate, uh, as far as we can, some of the alien species that uh, are not particularly beneficial to those migratory birds, nor are they beneficial to the, uh, the plants that make up our native uh, understory and canopy. That's, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Soros, Director of Lake County Programs at Open Lands. Thank you, Brandon. I've only got the one slide, uh, so no need for me to say next here. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Soros, Director of Lake County Programs at Open Lands. I've been working on land and water conservation projects in this region for over 30 years now. And some of the plans that I've participated in development and implementation of include this oak ecosystem recovery plan that we're talking about today. Um, I encourage everybody here to please read it, or at least just the first 33 pages of it. Um, it's excellent. And uh, it's 
I believe, going to hold up over time as much or even more than our guiding document, the Biodiversity Recovery Plan for the Chicago region. And while you're pulling it up to read it, I also encourage you to look up on the Chicago Region Trees Initiative site, um, the map of the witness trees of Illinois, and to go find the witness tree that's closest to your home. Uh, it will be eye-opening for you, pack a lunch, plan some time with that tree, because as someone said earlier today, um, these old oaks of ours are near the end, and we want to spend a little bit of time from them and learn from them as much as we can. I've been with Open Lands almost six years. If you're not familiar with us, we are a nationally accredited land trust. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. We have a deep bench of talent, ecologists, GIS specialists, policy specialists, real estate attorneys, arborists, foresters, and more. We have helped to protect thousands of acres in the Chicago region. We serve as lead advocates for public open space referendum and other policies. And we work on a variety of initiatives that are designed to make communities healthier and more verdant for all. A lot of open lands work and my work is connected to oak ecosystems. How can it not be? These are very important, iconic ecosystems for a region. At Open Lands, we hold conservation easements. Not all properties qualify for an easement, but I do want to mention that two that I've worked on recently in Lake County have specific language that regards oak protection. And one of them that we actually just placed on a property in Lake County just a couple of weeks ago calls out the Chicago Regional Trees Initiative and the oak mapping and identifies that that parcel has core oak ecosystem on it that needs to be protected. So that's the strength of a plan like this is that we can refer to it in our policies and our conservation easements, et cetera. Another thing I want to share is that it's about once a month, I am asked about tree preservation ordinances. And all I do is go to the CRTI website and copy the link for the variety of policy templates for tree preservation ordinances. And I send those to folks. If you don't live in a municipality that has tree preservation ordinances, um, Lydia and her team have made it easy for you to get one passed. In Lake County, our Lands in Harmony program is very popular. Uh, it's where we have some real talented people here working one-on-one -on -one with property owners and help them better understand their land and select some good conservation projects for their situation. I wish it was one size fits all. It would make this presentation a lot easier, but it's not. Uh, we help them understand that based on their situation and their property, their goals and their resources, time, money, et cetera, uh, help them understand what a really good project would be for them and then provide support to them. Um, not financial support necessarily, though sometimes, but um, we provide some attaboys and social nudges as they complete and maintain their projects. And we've learned a lot about how to work with people, what the barriers are that they're facing, um, and how to help overcome some of those barriers. It varies a lot. Uh, last week, my team and I, we were um, helping a park district with a, they had about a 20 acre oak woodland and they had us come out and walk the site with them and think through it. Gorgeous oak grove full of buckthorn. We found only one young oak on the whole property. It was about a foot tall. When we're on properties with people, they usually realize that their big old oaks are fabulous and important. What they frequently do not realize is it's that little one foot tall young oak that's their true treasure and that deserves everything they can throw at it for its protection. Um, in Lake County, I want to share that the vast majority of land is residential, privately owned. And a large number of people own significant parcels, but even the small ones are pretty spectacular in the natural resources and the buckthorn that they contain. 
And um, so we have learned that um, for over 10 years now, we've known this and we have learned that the vast majority of residential property owners in Lake County have turned over the management of their land to their landscaping professionals. And so we uh, increasingly are working with landscaping professionals, whether it's landscape architects and designers or um, the folks who are taking down trees, um, mowing the grass, clearing all of the leaves off the property, et cetera. We're working with that group a bit more. We also are part of the Conservation at Home family here in the Chicago re Wilderness Region. We do certify properties when they meet our criteria. A young oak has to be present. Plants that are native, truly native to Northeastern Illinois cover at least 5% of the landscape. Buckthorn covers less than 5% of the landscape. And um, the water, well, the quality and quantity of water leaving the property has to be pretty decent in order to certify. So I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Brandon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to all of our panelists for that great introduction. Um, I see that we've begun to, to answer some questions in the chat. And Sarah, a huge thank you to you for um, mentioning some of the resources that are available through CRTI for folks who want to, to act for OAKS. Um, and so I want to start our conversation um, on that theme. And, you know, I'm curious, Sarah, you mentioned conservation at home certification and sort of the sort of private landowner sort of component of this. And I'm just curious, from your perspective, what do you think are the reasons that people don't manage invasive species on their property? Sort of like, what are the, what are some of those barriers and how can we overcome those when we're talking to private landowners? Well, I think all of us, you know, the universal barriers for any project that we all want to do is time and money. Um, but specifically to this project, um, Buckthorn, for instance, is known to provide privacy and people want privacy. So we have to acknowledge that. Uh, policy, someone earlier mentioned how important that is. It sure is. Um, removing invasive species requires policy sometimes, depending on where you live. It's really nice when policy is teamed up with cost share. There are some wonderful towns in Lake County, for instance, Grays Lake, Riverwoods, other towns that provide cost share, um, that helps a lot. So I'm already talking about how to overcome those barriers, if that's okay, Brandon. But um, uh, th that's important. I, and I think that it's helpful for us to understand that botany's hard. Recognizing buckthorn compared to 7,000 other species that are out there is not easy. However, we all have a really big opportunity coming up. If we ever get a couple hard frosts with climate change, it's later and later. But as soon as a couple hard frosts come across this land, you could take almost anybody out there and they, you just show them anything that's still green, there it is. Um, another huge barrier is if we're going to be cutting down buckthorn, whatever its size, um, let's make sure that we're applying pesticides properly, the right amount, in the right conditions, at the right time of year, and the right chemical, and let's do it right, um, or we're going to create even more problems. I, I'll pause there. I hope I've answered that. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Casey, um, you mentioned policy in your in your. Uh, introductory remarks, and Sarah just sort of circled back and mentioned that too. In terms, uh, in terms of you know acting for Oaks, I'd love to invite you to say a little bit more about sort of policy opportunities that you know we might have in the region for helping Oaks. So as I as I mentioned, um, policy is set by a number of stakeholders in that arena. Of course, you have planners and you have the financial needs of uh, local governments, state governments. And, and very often, uh, it, 
when there are conservation concerns, these these uh, stakeholders are not kind of recognized for their powerful role that they play in the status of land, whether it's in a natural state or it's converted into human uses. And um, <clears throat> that I, I have seldom seen in the conservation discussion, whether it be for oak, oak forests or any other uh, um, land in the natural state. And I think that the, the conservation community really needs to recognize the, the powerful role of policy as well as ancillary actors such as the, the, the fin financial um, sector and the roles that they play in the preservation of oaks and um, natural lands in communities. Um, I think that's hopefully answered your question. Excellent. Thank you, Casey. Um, related, Robin in the chat raises a really good point that local municipalities and park districts can play a significant role by managing their own properties and parkways as well through local, you know, as well as through local policies. So it's, you know, thinking universally about, you know, who, who the landowners are, where these oak woodlands are present in sort of how they can be part of, of this process. I'll throw that question sort of out to anyone on the panel in terms of, of speaking to the importance of reaching beyond sort of forest preserves or sort of already, or, you know, properties protected fee simple by land trusts, or you know, private property owners and sort of what potential there might be in terms of businesses or HOAs or you know or universities or houses of worship or you know local parks. Sort of sort of where are some of the opportunities in terms of, of oak protection there? And I see Bob, you've got your hand raised, so I will call on you. Well, I uh, just this is uh, in a sense personal. I live in a subdivision in suburban Cook County that uh, immediately adjacent to the subdivision is a Cook County Forest Preserve called uh, Oldfield Oaks, very appropriately. And across the street from Oldfield Oaks are two north-south streets with homes built on them that uh, are populated with, the, uh, the site of the homes are populated with mature oaks. But uh, you don't see any seedling or small oaks on anywhere. So experimentally, we're, we're going to try a program through the Homeowners Association to do an inventory and to encourage the homeowners who have, you might say, oaks, mature oaks in their backyard uh, to, uh, to see if we, we can get folks to say, oh, I see an oak seedling that a, a squirrel planted. Uh, I'm going to uh, put a ring around it to keep the rabbits from browsing it but down to the ground or the deer browsing it down, whatever, and uh, uh, protect it. And in, in a sense, my own property is a laboratory for that because that's exactly what I've done over the years. I went from three oak trees on my property to 30 oak trees on my property just by protecting seedlings. So I think one of the important issues for the, the the whole program is to uh, get out there with the you might say the 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 homeowners identify areas where oaks may exist naturally uh, in people's backyards and develop programs that encourage them to uh, uh, protect those seedlings. It's it's a simple idea, but we're gonna. In a sense, we're going to be a, a bit of a laboratory to see if the idea works. Excellent. Thank, uh, thanks, Bob. Sarah, you have your hand up. Yes, I want to share. I mentioned residential properties, but in our program, we work with all property owners. Uh, Mary Fortman, I think, is on this call. She's walked one-on-one -on -one with property owners across over 1,500 properties in 10 years. Uh, golf courses, cemeteries, farms, parks, HOA common areas. So um, we work with people on the land that they own or the land that they can influence and uh, try to help them understand what's growing on their property and where their ecological treasures are. That one-on-one -on -one, uh, tailored information is very helpful. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. 
And you're thinking about land that that folks own or land that folks influence. I think that's a great turn of phrase. It's a great way to think about it. Um, I want to share, you know, some resources um, in the chat. And these are also available on the Chicago Region Trees Initiative website. But it's a series of brochures. Um, this is an example of one of them. It's the Healthy Hedges brochure that suggests alternatives um, to things like common buckthorn or hedges that are desirable for privacy or other uses um, and, re and suggest replacements. This is just one of a suite of three brochures um, that focus on, on hedges, sort of those one-to-one -one replacements or sort of ways to think about landscaping. Um, they also There's also one for healthy homes, um, which is focused on sort of the private landowner um, or the private property owner um, at that sort of scale that Bob's talking about or that Sarah's talking about previously. There's also one for ha healthy habitats that goes a little bit further into sort of the way that the oak ecosystem spread beyond sort of protected areas and into other types of properties. So that's a great and valuable resource for folks that I wanted to be sure to share. As we get near the, near the top of the hour, um, I also do want to share a couple of upcoming events and sort of opportunities. It is Oaktober, so happy Oaktober, everyone. Um, and here in the chat, I'm going to drop also a lot of links, a lot of links to the Chicago Region Trees Initiative website, um, including this one to the events page that has a list of upcoming Oaktober events. If you work for an organization, or an agency that has an Oaktober event, please be sure to reach out to, to the folks at CRTI um, to be able to get you know, your event put on this list. But I also want to invite everyone on the call today to an upcoming Oaktober workshop that's going to be held at the Morton Arboretum. Um, it's Oaks on the Move, and it's looking at sort of oaks and climate and um, and Lydia jumped in, um, and here is the actual link to that. Uh, but it's an upcoming workshop in person at the Morton Arboretum um, on October 25th. Um, and so even though on my screen at the moment, it says it's sold out, actually the registration is open. It is still open, especially for folks who are on this call. Um, any other final thoughts from our panels, from our panelists? Kurt, you know, thinking about, about sort of landscapes that are managed, you know, by an organization like the Morton Arboretum or, you know, an agency, um, how important is sort of volunteer stewardship um, in terms of, of thinking about oak restoration in the Chicago region writ whole? So we have about 10 million people in the Chicago region, and um, there's a lot of people who are interested in helping to improve these oak woodlands, savannas, and oak ecosystems in general. So we, um, at Morton Arboretum, we think it's really important to become uh, kind of invested in that process. So we, in, in our program to manage our woodlands, we have over 200 volunteers who come from the local community and help us within just the natural areas. So we rely heavily on volunteer stewards, um, but you know we just can't get this work done alone. And so we need to rely on the community to do that. And we have a great program that is offered through our education program. It's called the ENACT program, Natural Areas Conservation Training Program, which can help um, folks learn about plant ID and all the different facets of what's involved in stewardship. So it, you know, people can go through this. People have been going through the program, learning about different topics of interest to them and then applying it both at the operator, but also down the street from where they live. And so I think that's the really successful ingredient in that. So they can kind of take that knowledge and, and go out elsewhere. So I think it's really important, Brandon. Excellent. Thank you, Kurt. So with that, we've heard that, you know, thinking about policy and how you can shape policy, you know, at the municipal level or the broader level, we've heard about stewardship, volunteer opportunities um, in natural areas, sort of at any scale that you can that you can connect to. If you do own land of different sizes or landscapes, whether it's, you know, through a corporation or whether it's your own home, there are ways to think about that land that you either own or influence and how it can be a more healthy habitat and ecosystem. 
Um, we put out a slew of resources into the chat for learning more and participating. I will echo Sarah's um, urging of everyone to read the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan and get inspired. Um, and also, I would like to thank you, Chicago Wilderness Alliance, for letting us come on and talk about the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan work. If you would like to get involved um, with the Oak Ecosystem Co Recovery Plan Working Group, my email is there in the chat. It's brandon at boldbison.com. Shoot me an email saying, hey, I want to get involved and learn more about this, and we'll add you to the list. We meet twice a year um, virtually, and then we do lots of great tours and, and workshops and things throughout the rest of the year is sort of move things forward and share resources with each other. Um, thank you to the sponsors today um, for the CAFE series at Chicago Wilderness Alliance, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and the USDA Forest Service. Um, we will be sending out an email with the recording and the slides um, to everyone who attended today. If you would like to consider hosting a cafe through the Chicago Wilderness Alliance, please do reach out to Maria Sadowski, who's on the call today, or Laura Riley, um, who wasn't able to get back in to join us on the call. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to our panel today, um, to Kurt, to Casey, to Bob, and to Sarah for coming on, sharing their passion, talking about Oaks, talking about what we can do. Um, um, just thrilled to have you all on. Thank you for all you do as part of the working group. And um, we'll talk to everyone soon. Have a good afternoon.